Hi, everyone. Oh, I'd like to welcome everyone right now to our fourth happy hour in the happy hour series. Before Barbara Hughes, Central Florida branch president and ESU board member takes over, I just want to make a couple of announcements. The first, if you have any questions for Andrea during the course of the, the presentation, I'd ask that you make them either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, so that way we don't kind of, we have them collected for the end of the presentation where Andrea will answer them. I also want to give a special commendation to, again, the Central Florida branch with over 30 members who registered for today's uh, presentation. So special shout out to the Florida branch. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Barbara. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Hughes, president of the Central Florida branch of the English Speaking Union. I am honored today to be introducing Angela Mays to you. Angela has presented two programs to our Central Florida branch, so I personally can share and know that you will be delighted to, for her academic adventure this afternoon. Andrea, very much like Henry Folger, has had a lifelong obsession with Shakespeare and his times. Andrea was a former student of Frank McCourt who wrote Angela's Ashes. Andrea spent much of her Manhattan girlhood holed up in New York Public Library, listening to vinyl LP recordings of performances by the Shakespeare Royal Company. As I stated, she has had a passion for Shakespeare for some time. Recently, during the COVID-19 shutdown, Andrea even watched all, uh, re-watched actually, all of the Shakespeare plays online. Andrea has uh, economic degrees from the State University uh, of New York at Binghamton and UCL, UCLA in economics. Currently, she is an economics professor at California State at Long Beach. Not only is she an economics professor, but she is also an author. She wrote, the Millionaire and the Bard, Henry Folger's obsessive hunt for Shakespeare's first folio. So please stay tuned in. At the end of her presentation, we're going to have time for Q&A and two people's names are going to be announced that have been randomly selected to receive copies of The Millionaire and the Bard. Now it is indeed my great pleasure to introduce Andrea Mays, who will be delving into Shakespeare's scandals and scoundrels. Andrea? So much for that generous, whoops. Shift command A. Andrea, you, you actually Oops. need to, you're set now. I'm set now, okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to everybody, all the participants. I'm very pleased to be here with you and uh, participate in your speakers program. And uh, I, before I get going, I wanted to share with you my um, shrew driver, which uh, I will be drinking out of a martini glass because it's early here. Okay. You're back. Sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. All right. So uh, I just had a little sip of my um, shrew driver. And if you saw the recipe, which you'll, uh, you'll see, you'll see the recipe on a slide in a moment, but I added a couple extra dashes of sugar, not bitter, because uh, I want to give you only sugar, not bitter. Despite Catherine's uh, uh, de demeanor, I will be a little sweeter than that. So without further ado, let me uh, share with you my presentation. And as uh, we said before, I'd be happy to take questions um, when I'm done. So the, uh, this is just the, the cover of the book that I wrote, which I can talk more about later on. Um, why are we? Okay, so here is the, uh, the subject of my talk is the Shakespeare first folio scoundrels and scandals. And in doing research for my other book, I found 
there were a lot of kind of uh, shady characters who were doing business in the first folios. And, uh, you know, at first I thought, well, there's one interesting, colorful character. And then I thought, well, there's another interesting, colorful character. And before I knew it, I'd collected about eight stories of scoundrels who had either been dealers in the first folio or something tangential to that I'm going to talk about, or uh, they had been outright fraudsters or criminals. And uh, I'm going to give you four of the stories of these scoundrels today. So there is the recipe for my shrew driver. And I added, instead of extra bitters, I added extra sugar for today. Delicious. Lemoncello, vodka, and orange juice. Absolutely delicious. As a quick review, uh, for those of you who um, have not thought about how the first folio was made in a long time, uh, a quick review of first folio by the numbers. So first is, it is a gigantic book, 900 pages long. We think the best estimate is that 750 copies were printed in 1623. Of those 750, about 235 copies are known to survive. Uh, I say about because there's some uh, arbitrariness to what you consider to be a copy. So is it a copy if it's missing the cover? Is it a copy if it's missing a play? Is it a copy if it's missing the portrait on the front page, you know, so about 235 complete copies survive. And the record price to date for a first folio is $6.1 million. And that was an excellent, very fine copy within the last five years. The first folio is the book that arguably saved half of Shakespeare's plays from extinction. And the argument comes from the idea that about half of the plays, 19 of the plays, had been published in quarto form. So that would be the small sort of paperback size, single play copy form, but when Shakespeare was still alive. However, uh, so th those plays would probably have survived in one way. Although one of those plays, Titus Andronicus, had only had one copy that survived to the 20th century. So that was a little close. Of the plays that had not been published, they were in various forms, like a prompt copy that the theater owned, maybe some manuscripts that the copyist owned, and, and so on. And arguably, but for the actions of two of Shakespeare's friends, uh, uh, Hemings and Condell, about whom I'm going to speak a little bit, uh, these plays might have ended on the ash heap of history. We would not have co had copies of them. The quarto editions that had been published, like Hamlet had already been published more than once, Hamlet would probably have survived. But even so, the edition that would have survived would not have been one that was authorized by Shakespeare, nor edited by him, nor edited by anyone who had performed in the plays. So the first folio is the first collection of all of Shakespeare's known plays, minus one, that's Pericles, that's for a different talk. Uh, but that the copies that ended up in the, the copies of the plays that ended up in the first folio were the ones uh, that had been edited by two friends of Shakespeare's and two fellow shareholders in the Globe Theater with him. So John Hemmings and Henry Condell, shareholders in the, in the Globe Theater would have had access to the Globe Theater's prompt copies, and therefore they would have had access to uh, manuscripts and so on that other publishers would not have. And Hemings and Condell had been acting in Shakespeare's plays with him and or under his directorship uh, since 1597. So they knew how the plays were performed and they could look at the first quarto of Hamlet and say, oh, no, that's not how we did it. No, that's not what the line was. This is what the line was. They assembled their sources, uh, divided the plays into three categories for the first time, comedies, histories, and tragedies. And they oversaw saw the publishing of this book from start to finish. So it's a unique book in that it saves half of the plays from extinction 
and it was properly edited by people who had already performed in it. So here's a, a very famous uh, portrait that what we all think Shakespeare looked like. Why do we think Shakespeare looked like that? Well, it's from this portrait, which was not made from life, but was um, made while people who knew Shakespeare were still alive. So Hemings and Condell would have seen this and said, yeah, that's what he looked like, or no, he had blonde curly hair and a full head of it. Uh, so this is what we, this is one of the two sources we have for what Shakespeare looked like, that famous portrait on the front of the first folio. Uh, this is just two random pages out of Hamlet from the uh, a, a printed copy of the first folio so that you get an idea of what the layout looked like, what the print looked like. It's two columns, there are scene divisions, there are uh, printer's ornaments at the top and in the, in the uh, text as well. It's, it's a beautiful book. And that would be about 13 inches by about eight inch, uh, by about 16 with two pages open like that, just for an idea of what the size is big. So on to the scandal. So scandal number one is a book that was published in 1623 that lasts 400 years. That's pretty amazing. And in, in pretty large numbers when you think of it. But there were some enemies of the first folio and one uh, sort of uh, good news, bad news example of a scandal would be those people who would deface copies. So there's several that I want to talk about. So one is that authors, sorry, owners of the copies of the first folio would often write on them. So they might note, for example, in a copy, this is actually from a quarto, but this is a representative idea here, that you would have the actor's names scratched into the, the margin of the book saying who it is that played each of the characters. Or you would have, uh, a page that was missing from the first folio. So if you didn't have the poem on printed on the page facing the portrait as you have here, you would just hand write it in there and you know scratch that in with your own handwriting. Then there were authors, uh, owners who would make notations about either performance or about the text or about the history and just scratch them into the book. So those are scratched in for, for history. There is one copy of the first folio at Meisei University in uh, Japan that is so chock-a-block with marginalia, with this writing in the margin like this, it's not only vertical but horizontal and in between the lines and it's you know hundreds and hundreds of words per page in the marginalia. So uh, that would be one example of the, the scandals would be People defaced these books over time, but we're very happy to have the book survive at all. And occasionally the things that they wrote in the margin are interesting, like which actor portrayed Hamlet or uh, whether the performance was a good one or whether there was an entrance or an exit as a director might, for example, annotate a copy. I wanna talk about scoundrel number one, and this would be uh, I, I maybe put scoundrels in, in quotation marks there because uh, it's not universally be, um, agreed that these were all scoundrels. In fact, it was Americans who were flush with cash, who were going over to Europe and to England in particular with stacks of cash to buy their culture. And lots of copies of the first folio crossed the Atlantic uh, as a result of collector, American collectors buying copies in England and then transporting them to the United States. Uh, Henry Huntington was one, J.P. Morgan, and then Henry Folger, about whom I've written, uh, did the most uh, 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 damage, if you will, uh, bringing 81 copies of the first folio across the Atlantic from uh, England and other places uh, to the United States. And in the Gilded Age, eight, late 1890s, early 1900s, book sales were a, a big news item. And especially if you were, you know, the equivalent of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett being the collectors, that's who was collecting these copies of first folios. 
and their sales would make the first page of the New York Times. So we have records, for example, of how much they paid for these various copies through articles in the New York Times or some, one of the collector's magazines. Collector's clubs grew in number and prestige, and Grolier's Club in New York is one example of such a place. Why do I call them scoundrels? Well, people who were on the other side of the pond were uh, outraged that Americans with cash, cash, can you imagine it, were buying up British culture and bringing it to the United States. It was an outrage that these copies of the first folio were being taken across the pond. In The Millionaire and the Bard, I give details of a particular copy that had been owned by the Bodleian Library, that the Bodleian Library at Oxford had sold as surplus, and then later desperately tried to buy back from a collector. Uh, the uh, librarians at the Bodleian Library were terrified that some American was going to uh, write a check and bring that copy to the new world. Couldn't we afford to uh, keep that copy here, he pleaded to the Oxford alum. Uh, I'll leave you to read the book as to find out who it is that ended up with that book. Henry Huntington was famous for buying up culture uh, in the UK and then bringing it back to the United States. And this is a cartoon that appeared after he, but so you see Uncle Sam there with a copy of Gainsborough's Blue Boy under his arm. Huntington in 19, I think it's 22, bought a copy, this copy of the um, first folio that is under his arm, but he also bought Gainsborough's Blue Boy, which he brought back to the United States. And I have seen it many times as it hangs in the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. So you see Huntington with the first folio on, under one arm and Gainsborough's Blue Boy under the other. Shakespeare's ghost trembling in the back, in the background of the cartoon, fearing that Henry Huntington is going to dig his bones up from the Trinity Church and bring them back to the United States as well. Some scoundrels, number two. Uh, number two scoundrel would be forgers of the folio pages. And they come in two categories that I'm gonna talk about. So one is um, people who would deliberately create forged facsimile pages that were missing from copies of the first folio. So a collector could increase the value of his or her copy if it was a complete copy. So not missing any plays, not missing some very particular pages like the last page, which tended to get um, torn out or damaged over time. And so book dealers would supply those individual pages or plays into copies of the first folio, sometimes without the knowledge of the collector. So occasionally they would say, well, you know, we, we have a stash of single pages from other copies of first folios, for example, that were irreparably damaged or very incomplete, or we only have a copy of one play. And then they would buy those, those leaves and supply them into other copies to make them complete. And again, sometimes this was done with the collector's knowledge, but not always. And there were certain dealers who dealt specifically in supplying these missing pages to uh, copies of the first folio. Uh, a special case, one who is not a forger, but an expert facsimile crafter was a man named John Harris, who would make mm, repairs to books that had damage on them. And he would paint in or pen, uh, use pen and ink to uh, repair damage, for example, on pages or replace pages that were missing from a particular copy of a particular book, but always at the request of the library. So the, the British Museum would say, oh, this page, this corner of this page was damaged. We've repaired the page. Can you add the words that were missing? And Harris would do that. One problem arose that Harris was such a good facsimile creator, and if he had had bad intentions, he could have had a great career as a forger, uh, that they could not tell the facsimiles that he created from the originals. And so starting in 1843, they 
made Harris sign his facsimiles so they could know which were the facsimile pages and which were the originals. So here you have a pen facsimile on the left side and the original on the right side. And oh my goodness, what a great forgery that is on the left side. Very hard to detect um, which is the original and which is the, the copy, especially if you make them on period paper. More about that coming up. This is a, on the left side, a John Harris facsimile page, again, made drawing it by hand with pen and ink. And we can tell that because at the bottom, we can tell that it's a Harris copy because at the bottom of the printer's ornament, there's a signature. Now this picture is so pixelated, you can't quite see it, but you can see that it's a little different than the printer's ornament on the right side, but very hard to detect the forgery. So again, if you had bad intentions, we're gonna talk about someone who did. If you had bad intentions, you could very easily pass off your work as genuine. Some forgeries, not like those John Harris copy I just showed you, are easier to spot. So here's somebody trying to fake their way through not having a, you know, through having a torn copy of the title page. Eh, not such a great copy. So this would be from a copy at the Folger Shakespeare Library. It has both a, an owner's marginalia at the bottom and a very bad facsimile attempt, attempt at the top. Scoundrels number three, here is somebody who had bad intentions. He is truly a scoundrel. And this is a story that takes place in the 1790s. So think about the time that the US Constitution is being written. Uh, this is going on at the same time. So this is William Henry Ireland, who is a teenager at the time of the story that I'm going to tell you takes place. His father, Samuel Ireland, was a collector of Shakespeareana. He collected quartos, he collected uh, documents, uh, playbills, anything related to Shakespeare writing, books, um, reviews, but he didn't have any original Shakespeare documents. There's a good reason for that because even today we only have six words or two words written repetitively um, in Shakespeare's own hand, and that's his name. We don't have any manuscripts, not a poem, not a sliver of a side, nothing in Shakespeare's own hand. But that was not known in 1790, uh, that, that such things did not exist. And to get his father's attention and approval, William Henry had, came up with the idea that he could go around to some London book dealers cut out the uh, some blank pages from some old 17th century books, make up his own version of 17th century ink, and then forge documents in the hand of William Shakespeare. Quite ambitious and um, enterprising of a 19 year old. You gotta give him uh, props for that. So William Henry, at first discovers a man named Mr. H who's got a trunk full of documents and William Henry is taking them out one by one and seeing uh, what the documents are. He brings them home to his father who is thrilled to have copies of original Shakespeare, a few lines in Shakespeare from a, a well-known play signed, you know, William Shakespeare, a letter and then another letter, and then another letter from Shakespeare to his wife, Anne Hathaway, completed with a lock of Shakespeare's hair attached to the letter. Uh, the, the documents over time get more and more impressive. Uh, a little bit of verse, a little bit of prose, these fantastic letters to Anne Hathaway. And finally, William Henry decides he's going to present his father with a newly discovered Shakespeare manuscript. So William Henry forges using his left hand, so his handwriting is not as recognizable, forges an entire 
quote unquote Shakespeare play presented to his father. His father shares it with the intelligentsia of London, shows off what he's got, the only uh, missing play of Shakespeare. He persuades a play company in in uh, London, the Shake, uh, Shakespeare, sorry, Theatre Royal at Drury Lane to perform the play. So let me give you a little bit of the artwork related to that. So here's William Henry. Here is a letter from William Shakespeare, and I'm not sure who that's to, but you have the, um, the seal and the signature of a, quote, genuine document that William Henry supplies to his father. Then there are, uh, there's prose. This is, uh, some of these are from the Houghton Library. Some of them are from the Widener Library and a couple are from the Folger Shakespeare Library. Uh, then here is the play that William Henry creates for his father uh, called Rowena and Vortigern, an uh, original preface by William Henry Ireland and presented in 1830 at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, uh, a newly discovered drama of William Shakespeare. Uh, this is uh, with, uh, Samuel Ireland, his father. That's Boswell, who once he's a uh, Shakespeare scholar who once he saw the copy of the play and these letters to Anne Hath letters to Anne Hathaway said he could die contented having seen these documents. So everybody was buying this hook, line, and sinker until they start to do rehearsals of the play. And the actors figure out, hmm, something is not right here. This really stinks. This is not Shakespeare. So they have a suspicion that this is not real. They start to mock the play. They perform it for one night. And William Henry, there's the, uh, a copy of a love letter with the Shakespeare's lock of hair. Uh, the uh, scandal that this is actually a fake, it's not a real Shakespeare play, hits the presses. A cartoon is made. You can see uh, Shakespeare on the on the wall in this living room. This is supposed to be the Ireland family, including William Henry and Samuel Ireland, plus the mother and father. You've got a, a book with uh, Shakespeare's uh, coat of arms on it. And you have this trunk that Mr. H has that is full of these Shakespeare documents, but you can see that all the members of the family are the ones who are forging it. So the scandal encompassed the entire family, not just 19-year-old William Henry. So William Henry confesses to his father and says, Dad, I'm really sorry. Uh, I faked all of this. I wrote the play. I wrote the letters. I wrote the prose. And his father, in return, says, you're not that good. You couldn't have done this. I think these are real. You could not possibly have forged that play because you're not talented enough to do that. Oh, so William Henry uh, crushed, more letters, more letters, crushed, but still with tremendous amounts of chutzpah, decides to turn his lemons into lemonade and he writes his confession. So now he's written a book uh, with his, which is the Confessions of William Henry Ireland, how he forged the manuscripts that he had bought the 17th century paper that he had faked using coal dust and boot black and oil and made lamp, lamp smoke and had put it into a, 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 a container and then made ink out of that. He confesses all of this and of course the book sells really well. So not only is he a forger, he's a very clever forger, and he snowed a lot of the intelligentsia, and he was able to turn this into a successful memoir of his cheating ways. Okay. And alas, as I mentioned, all we have of Shakespeare's writing is six copies of his signature from various legal documents. And the signature is not exactly the same on all of them. And you can see then that William Henry used that as the basis for forging this Shakespeare 
uh, signature there on the left. But again, if you have no examples of the printing of the writing, you can say, this is what the writing looks like. And that's what he did. Now moving on into the 21st century and a 21st century scoundrel, Mr. Raymond Scott. This is really very specifically about the first folio in that Mr. Scott was a collector of books. He lived in what we would call a housing project with his mother, but drove a Ferrari and uh, was a bit of an exotic character. So let me tell you the story of Mr. Raymond Scott and what it was uh, he was alleged to have stolen. All right. Uh, a copy of the Shakespeare First Folio was purchased by John Cousin, who would later become the Bishop of Durham in Durham, uh, England. And the bishop endowed a library at Durham University in 1660. So this is only 37 years after the printing of the first folio. So we have the provenance of that copy from 1660 all the way to uh, the time that it is stolen. And you'll see that in a minute. In 1998, Durham University puts on a show, a, an exhibit, of its, the finest in its collection. And that includes the Shakespeare First Folio and lots of other rare books. Uh, unfortunately, they have really bad security, not very much security at all. Librarians here would be astonished to find out the conditions in which that First Folio lived. Um, and not surprisingly, the First Folio was stolen along with 10 other rare books. So disappears, that makes the news, of course. At the time in 1998, we might be talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million for this copy. It has a 17th century binding, right? It's had one owner since 1660, so it's the original 17th century binding, goat skin. It's got a few things about it that are very distinctive. Uh, so, uh, you know, some markings on the book for the University of Durham. So they might, for example, say this book copy is uh, uh, property of the University of Durham. And some other things like it might be missing this page or that page, or there might be damage on that page. And the university knew how to describe its copy to the police who are then going to look, put that up on Interpol and then look around the world for anybody who wanted to sell a copy of the first folio, they might be able to identify it. One man, a man named Anthony West, did a survey. Uh, he began at least 25 years ago, probably he had started before 1998 and he lived in England. So the Durham copy might've been one he would have examined pretty early on. And he basically took inventory of the unique characteristics of each copy. So describing in great detail what the cover looked like, which pages were missing, were there, was there damage to the pages? So he did some general work on that in, in many of the copies early on, and then page by page descriptions much later. But by the time he did those page by page descriptions of other copies, this copy was already missing somewhere out in the ether. So 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, it's up on Interpol, all the collectors, all the auction houses know this copy is missing and are keeping an eye out. So they think they have marked the book in a way that it is unique and recognizable, uh, but as it turns out, they haven't. Anthony West, uh, this is the guy who did the, the inventory of the copies and he would be able to tell you in great detail how to describe what that Durham copy looked like. Uh, a man shows up, this, is, this photograph here is taken in the Folger Shakespeare Library. A man shows up to the Folger Shakespeare Library in 2008 with a copy of a big old book in a plastic bag. 
Uh, most people at the Folger Library look like people who study in English and American literature. They're uh, pretty conservative dress. And the guy who walks into the library has a leisure suit and a, a, a Panama hat and a big cigar and lots of gold jewelry. And he walks into the librarian at the Folger and he says, I bought this old book from one of Fidel Castro's bodyguards. I think it's a Shakespeare first folio. Can you verify that for me? So he gives the copy to Richard Kuta, who is the Folger librarian. And the librarian says, you know, I might need to keep this overnight and do a little research to see, to verify that it is a copy of the Shakespeare first folio. Just leave it with me overnight and I'll get it back to you tomorrow. Come by tomorrow. Uh, in the interim, by the way, this the guy who walks into the Folger buys a big cake for the staff of the Shakespeare Folger Library. Uh, interesting creature. So, of course, uh, Richard Kuta, oh, let me not skip ahead to that. Richard Kuta, the um, librarian at the Folger, calls the FBI and says, I think I have the stolen copy of the Durham First Folio. He gets on the phone with Anthony West and he says, what can I look for that's unique? Well, the book has had its cover torn off because that's certainly unique and recognizable, disappeared. It's got the pages that say this copy property of Durham University, that's torn out. Any other easily identifiable things related to the university, they've all been destroyed, taken out of the book. And what's left is this just shell of the book um, with what the, the, the man who brought the book in, Raymond Scott, thinks is devoid of uh, markings that would identify it as the Durham copy, but not so. Again, we have Anthony West, we have Richard Kunta, who are able to determine and, and testify at trial how they know this is the specific copy that was stolen from the Durham Library. It's not some heretofore unknown copy of the Shakespeare First Folio. It is one uh, that they know was stolen from the Durham Library. As one example, uh, Anthony West had measured a hole that had been kind of squished into uh, the some pages in the First Folio. So he said, for example, you know, at uh, Act one, scene four of Hamlet, lines 300 to 310, there's a triangular indentation. It looks like the cover of the book was closed with something triangular inside the book. And here's the measurement of the indentation and so on. And they look in this copy and sure enough, there is that indentation. So they have that and other uh, forensic evidence that they present at trial that conclusively shows that the copy is uh, the one that was stolen from the Durham uh, University Library. Mr. Scott is convicted, not of theft, they cannot prove that he has stolen the copy, but he is convicted of fencing, of receiving stolen, stolen property. And he is offered leniency in exchange for revealing the whereabouts of the cover and the other missing parts of the book. So the book is, let's say, $5 million. And its value is significantly enhanced by the presence of its original 17th century binding. We'll knock some time off your sentence if you give us the binding back. They searched his house, they searched the tips, the dumpsters around his house, and they never found uh, those pieces and Mr. Scott never surrendered them. So this is the copy of the book without its cover missing its pieces of the cover. There's the FBI agent and the uh, one of the constables who is guarding that book as it's returned to Durham University. The trial of Mr. Raymond Scott received a great deal of attention. This was a very big deal in England when this was going on. And as I mentioned, Mr. Scott was a very flamboyant kind of character. So he would arrive in a limousine with a pretty girl on his arm and uh, sometimes looking like he was dressed to go on safari. He was quite a character. Um, there's the $15 million 
uh, I don't think it's 15 million pound, but it's an expensive book that is recovered. There he is arriving in a limousine in his Kiana pants, uh, arriving at his trial in that, in that getup and with a bottle of Dom Perignon there. Uh, he should have had instead a, a shrew driver. That would have been much better. Mr. Scott, as I mentioned, was convicted. He was sent to prison and he was uh, uh, sentenced to eight years in prison for fencing stolen property. The story, however, does not end there. I could not make up the, the next fact that I'm going to tell you what was Mr. Scott's job while he was in prison. He worked while he was in prison. What was his job? Um, he was the librarian. Of course he was. All right, so a lover of books, he became the librarian. The story, however, has a very sad ending, and that is that Mr. Scott committed suicide while he was in jail. So he did not live out his eight year sentence and then get released. Uh, he committed suicide while he was in, uh, incarcerated. So a sad end to his story. Uh, I've only begun to skim the surface of the scoundrels associated with a first folio from the dealers who would supply facsimile pages without telling collectors to the thieves who would try to steal valuable copies. There are st still several copies that have been stolen, one from Williams College, for example, that are still out there in the ether. There is a copy that has been missing for a very long time and a very well-renowned uh, old book appraiser had the opportunity to, he thought, to go to Japan to look at a copy that might be the one that was stolen with the agreement that he would not reveal the identity of the people who owned it. He went to Japan, was put up by this family in a hotel. They were going to show him the, uh, their copy of the Shakespeare First Folio but they got cold feet, I guess, because the statute of limitations on the theft had not yet run and they were afraid that they might be accused of having stolen the copy and therefore they did not allow this appraiser to look at, that, at their copy. The statute will have run in another four years. So maybe in four years, another copy will be returned to the, um, into the auction world. So we'll see. Okay, um, let me mention two other people that are related to scoundrels here. So one is a collector named James Orchard Hallowell Phillips, who collected all kinds of Shakespeareana from soup to nuts. His house was just packed with books and documents related to and reviews and theater and so on and so forth. He was accused of having stolen documents um, from various libraries in England. So he would go to do, he was a very renowned Shakespeare scholar. He would go to do research. And then three years later, they would say, huh, that's funny. There are pages missing from this book. And some of those pages happened also to reside in Hallowell Phillips' uh, collection. So he was one character who was accused of never went to trial, never uh, convicted of any kind of theft, but uh, accused repeatedly of going into various collections and taking copies. There is also a copy that disappeared from another university library in the United States that was, again, this is a gigantic book. And the person or persons who stole the book went in took the book out of its cover, replaced the guts of the book with a copy of Reynard the Fox, turned the book back into the librarian, librarian put it on the shelf and it was 20 years before anybody noticed it was missing. Okay, so there are lots and lots of examples of people, these Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare scoundrels who cannot keep their hands off first folios and find it uniquely appealing uh, for, for 
all kinds of reasons, not only that it's an extremely valuable book, but that it has this in, uh, important connection to English language literature and the plays of Shakespeare. My revels have now ended and I will uh, sign off and take any questions that you might have for me. Um, I will close my presentation in a moment here, but I did want to shout out a special thank you to Barbara Hughes at Winter Park uh, Central Florida English Speaking Union. To you and your members, thank you so much for bringing me out for the first time. I so enjoyed my time there. And also to Sandra Powers, who was also instrumental in bringing me um, to Central For Florida the first time. So thank you so much for your attention. And I hope I can answer some questions for you. Yeah, so we have some questions that have already come Okay, so the first of these is, how many plays did Shakespeare write? I'm seeing different numbers in different places. Right. Well, in some ways, it depends on how you count that he wrote something. So there's some plays that he wrote in collaboration with others we know, Two Noble Kinsmen, for example. Uh, so do you count that as being by Shakespeare or not? So the usual count is 36 in the first folio, uh, plus Pericles, which was not in the first folio, plus two noble kinsmen, which brings us to 38. So if you exclude the collaborative effort with John Fletcher, then you're down to 37. And the only reason Pericles was excluded from the first folio is Someone had previously published the, the uh, Pericles in quarto form and having done so, it's not exactly that they had copyright, but they had some rights to being the only publisher who would print copies of that play. So uh, Hemings and Condell needed permission from the rights holder in order to be able to include that in their first folio. And the publisher had lots of unsold copies of Pericles sitting around the bookshop. And so he's, he didn't give his permission. So um, uh, the Pericles is the only one that, uh, that is missing from the, the volume. I hope that answers your question. All right, so Sandra uh, Picar asks, was Andrew Carnegie one of the collectors of Shakespeare? Wow, not that I know of. I'd have to look it up. No, he was not a big collector of Shakespeare. Uh, the, the big Americans uh, that you might know, I've already mentioned, but there are lots and lots of them. So um, Anthony West, when he did his survey, did a graphic of what where the first folios went after 1623 and they stay put in england and northern europe for a very long time and then at the end of the 19th century they start to move across the, the pond and overwhelmingly they all come to the united states so they're in chicago and san francisco and los angeles and irvine and and so on and so forth so you can see where they traveled and then of course they've been resold since then the largest collection of Shakespeare first folios in the world is 82 copies at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. The next largest collection is 13 copies at Meisei University in Tokyo. That's a 20th century phenomenon that th those things went uh, from various collectors, some in the United States, some in Europe to Meisei. And then the next largest collection is five at the British Library, four at the Huntington Library in um, San Marino, California. So All right. Carnegie, so, I don't know. I, I, I can look it up, but I don't think so. Not that I know of. Um, so Jeff Schnabel asks, the Bodleian copy of the first folio has quite a history. Henry Folger had quite a difficult time purchasing the book. Could you tell a little about these, that acquisition? Yeah, so the Bodleian is at Oxford, and uh, at some point uh, they must have run out of uh, bookshelf space, and they decided to have a library sale. And in the library sale, they put their copy of the Shakespeare first folio, 
Why could they get rid of their first folio? Because the third folio had already been printed. They got a copy of that and surely the third folio is better than the first folio. So let's just get rid of our old first folio. They put it in the library sale and they sell it for 24 pounds. A librarian's son ends up with a copy of the first folio in the, I think it's 1924, but early 1920s. Uh, he brings a copy to Gladwin Turbot at the Bodleian and says, you know, here's a first folio. I think there might be, you know, I think it's authentic and there might be some connection to Oxford. There might be some connection to the, the Bodleian. And the librarian and some other people who are at the Bodleian examine the copy and they find out not only is it an authentic first folio, but it is the copy that was sold as surplus um, in, their, in the Bodleian sale. And of course, the Bodleian is, has been trying to find this copy and would love to buy it and have it back. So interesting little point, one of the ways they were able to verify that it was the Bodleian copy is that the Bodleian had all of their books bound by the same guy, a guy named William Wild Goose. And the furniture on the book, so imagine you've got this thick leather book and on the end of it is a hasp, like what you would, you would put a padlock through, there's a hasp, and then a chain is run through the hasp and the chain is attached to the bookshelf. So you can take the book off the shelf, but it's chained to the shelf so you can't steal it. You can't take it away. You, there's like a, a lectern underneath. You put the book on it and you can stand there and read. So the furniture that was on this book, the hasp and the, the binding, are like the ones at, on the other books at the, at the Bodley. And so, oh my gosh, not only is it a first folio, it is our first folio, not so fast. It's not yours yet. So the librarians ask the collector, would you be willing to sell this to us? Uh, okay, yes. So he gives them a price. Um, I think it's 2,500 pounds. You can look it up in the Millionaire and the Bard. I have it in there. 2,500 pounds. You, you have, uh, I don't remember what the deadline was, 90 days. If you can raise 2,500 pounds, you can buy it. Of course, when uh, the librarians discover this, they open their mouths and they you know, advertise this in uh, notes and comments or the London papers saying, look what we found, we found this copy and so-and-so possesses it. Well, Henry Folger's dealers, book dealers in London, approach the collector and say, how much? And the guy quotes them a price. He says, yeah, but I, I've kind of given the Bodley and write a first refusal, so we've got to see if they're going to be able to raise the money. And Henry Folger basically says, I'll write you a check now. Here's the check, you know, I'll take the book. It takes a few months with entreaties published in the London papers. Uh, Please help us raise enough money. Otherwise, this book is going to find its way across the pond like so many British treasures. Please help us raise the money to be able to uh, buy this book. Uh, back from the, and put it in its, in its rightful place. Is there no son of Oxford who's willing to pony up the money to do this? Well, they don't make it. The 90 day deadline passes. They don't have enough money. More outrage, more op-eds op in, the, in, the, in the papers. Can't somebody uh, put us over the top so we can buy this copy back? And, and again, Henry Folger is waiting there with a check in his hand. Well, a, a governor, uh, Royal in Canada kicks in the final 500 pounds, puts them over the top, and the Bodleian is able to buy their copy back. So that original copy with the Bodleian binding on it is back safe at home in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. A small postscript to that story. Uh, in 2011, the Folger Library did a, an enormous display of copies of the first folio, mostly their own, but not all their own. There are some other copies, for example, one that was burned almost to a cinder 
in a library in Philadelphia and there's a little burned little husk of the book that still exists and they put that on display. They also asked the Bodleian if they would lend their copy for the exhibition temporarily. And of course the Bodleian said, uh-uh, no way, it stays here. So I hope that answers your question. Great, so the next question is from Clark Goodwin who asks, what was the third university that lost a folio after Durham and Williams College? Ooh. I don't remember. I know those two are still, uh, th that there are two that are still missing and I don't remember what the second one is. Have to look it up in the book. Um, so someone else asks, um, did you have the opportunity to view the, folio, the folios at Dulwich College, east of London? I know you've kind of already answered the second part, but they ask, is that one of the largest collections? No, uh, Dulwich is not. Uh, the, as I said, the uh, Folger is the largest with 82, May Say with 13, the British Library with five, Huntington Library with four, and then we're in two single copies in most of the other libraries. Um, I have not been to Dulwich. I would be delighted to be in Dulwich if you know somebody who could get me in to see the copy. Um, the, the good news is if you're a, a first folio freak, 82 of the copies are all in one building. That's, that's the Folger collection. So 82 out of 235, that's a lot. And then across the street, at the Library of Congress, there are two more copies. I've seen them, spent the afternoon with them a couple of times. And then there are various copies around the United States. I spend some time every year um, caressing the copy that is at University of California at Irvine. They have a, an alum who donated his copy of the first folio there, and I get to visit that. There's one at UCLA, uh, which is a little harder to see, amazingly, even though I'm an alum there. Um, but I have not seen the one in Dole, which I'd be delighted to. All right, uh, Margaret Fletcher asks, when I was in high school, there was much co pseudo, perhaps, controversy, whether Shakespeare really wrote the plays. Was he well educated enough to do so, et cetera? What do you think? Well, there are two answers to that. So one is, we have the plays. So whether they were written by a guy named William Shakespeare or they were written by some other guy named William Shakespeare, whoever, we have the plays. So that's kind of the most important thing is that we have these plays. Second, the idea that he could not have done this because he was not university educated is um, an unwillingness to accept the existence of genius. And I would point you to Einstein, some clerk in a Swiss government agency, and Mozart and Beethoven and Shakespeare are all in the same category. Someone who's an outlier on the distribution of genius, you know, three sigma above normal, and we don't know why. So I don't buy the argument that you would have to have gone to university in order to be able to write a story, the stories that he did. There are lots of mistakes in the stories that he wrote. So it's not like, He's an expert in geography, but he has Bohemia, which is landlocked, uh, having people wash ashore from a shipwreck. You know, he makes a lot of mistakes. So it's not, it's not he's not a university educated geographer uh, who wrote this, but it's, to me, it's a less interesting problem than the fact that we have the plays that that's a little more important to me than if we found out that it's actually got some guy named Joe Smith who wrote them. Yeah, I like the stories about who might have written them. So Christopher Marlowe did not die in a tavern brawl in Deptford with a knife in his eye. He actually survived and went to um, Italy and wrote all the, the manuscripts or it was the Earl of Oxford uh, whose great, 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 great nephew interviewed me. Uh, Jeff Dever is the Dever Oxford. 
uh, Ayer, and he interviewed me. He does not believe that the Earl of Oxford wrote them and so on. So the stories are interesting. They, you know, they're great concoctions and great fiction, but I don't, I don't think they're right. There, it would take too great a conspiracy. Uh, the actors, the theater owner, the publishers, all who would have known, of course, the guy wrote the plays or no, that guy didn't write the plays. So yeah, thanks for fun fiction. All right. Uh, so Isabel Malkin writes, does Harvard have one or more folios? Uh, they have at least one at the Widener. Yale, I think, has two. All right. I think this is probably the last one that we have. Um, can you describe for us the Folger Library? Sure. It is, I can describe it for you in great detail because I have spent many, many moons in the library there and I lived uh, a few blocks away from it for over a decade. Uh, on the outside, it's got very classical lines. It's uh, Georgia marble white and fits right in with the Supreme Court, the Library of Congress and the Capitol. Uh, but it has some aluminum deco touches on the outside. So there are aluminum grills over the windows. There are engravings of Shakespeare quotations around the outside in the marble. And when you walk inside, there's a spectacular puck fountain. So puck from Midsummer Night's Dream is on top of a fountain, what fools these mortals be on the, on the side. You've got a fantastic view across the street of the US Capitol. Uh, and then when you walk inside the building, the first thing you see is an Elizabethan hunting house, a hunting lodge. So deco, gorgeous marble, hammered aluminum on the outside, and then you walk into a hunting lodge. So it looks very Elizabethan, giant fireplaces, lots of artwork. Uh, there are tile floors around the, the main exhibit hall that have masks made in mosaics and the names of the plays in the in the floor as you walk around there's some of the folger art and treasures on display there all the time including there's always a copy of a first folio on display in the exhibit hall and there's an electronic copy as well so you can electronically scroll through a copy of the first folio in the entryway to get anywhere else oh and then there's a theater which was not originally meant to be a theater, but it has been renovated over the years so that it is a working theater. It looks like a, an in-yard theater with a balcony around the top and lots of poles in your way because it looks just like an in-yard theater. Uh, the heavens are lighted and, and painted with a fresco. Um, and to get anywhere else in the building, you need to have a credential as a reader. So there is a, uh, a library and uh, reading rooms, two reading rooms, and a, it's a spectacular place to do research. Wonderful place, wonderful place to collaborate and meet other people who have an interest in Shakespeare. Not to miss it, across the street from the, from the Library of Congress and the Supreme Court, terrific place to visit. All right, so actually there is, there is one more that I missed previously from Christopher okay. Kahn. Okay. Who asks, um, where is the, I believe they're from Central Florida, so they ask, where is the closest first folio to Orlando? Road trip, we promise not to steal it, maybe. I might have to look that up for you. Let me think. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I can get back to you on that, but I have a book that will tell you where your closest first folio is. There's certainly one so are you, if you're snowbirds and you go somewhere else, um, there's certainly one in Chicago. You can go see that one. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I don't know. Florida International University had a copy on display for a year, uh, but that's gone. I'm not sure where the nearest public, uh, public I assume you mean, uh, copy. Uh, there's two in New York at the New York Public Library. Uh, you can see the one at Yale at the Elizabethan Club, uh, Harvard at the Widener Library. Uh, I can I, I'm better at knowing where they are on the West Coast because that's where I go. Uh, the Sutro Library in San Francisco, uh, 
Mills College has one in uh, across the East Bay. UCLA has one. UC Irvine has one. Those are the closest ones that public publicly available. I right. get um, that is my next task. I need to do some research. <laughs> I, I have the book upstairs that will tell me, but I'm not sure where the closest one is to Central Florida. I will look that up and let you know. Um, I wonder if it's in Miami. I don't know. I'll, I'll look also. I also just want to, one of the things that we've done for today's happy hour is that we do have a book giveaway. So I just want to congratulate the two winners. Um, so Sharon Merriman, Merriman from Indianapolis branch, you'll be receiving a copy, as well as Diane Banks from the Nashville branch. Well, great. Congratulations to both of them. Enjoy the book. And Andrea, I'd like to kindly and warmly thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I have seen it before or seen bits and pieces of it, and you always change it up every single time and add a few more things. But I want to warmly thank you for sharing your knowledge uh, of Shakespeare and his scandals and his scoundrels with us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, I understand we also have some participants who are uh, in France. Is that right? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay, bienvenue à nos amis francophones en France. I'm delighted that you're attending. All right. Um, well, with that, I think we'll be um, closing out um, this happy hour session. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank Cheers. you, you also. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrea. Bye bye. Bye. I hope that's not too far.